effort with the Appalachian Summer Festival. We are delighted to be partners with, with them in bringing this to you. Uh, I'm all, I've also been asked to announce that uh, this evening there will be a family evening, a showing of E.T. in uh, the Schaefer Auditorium on the big screen. Uh, it is available to families and uh, free popcorn. So uh, if you're looking for possible entertainment site this evening, suggest that you uh, go to the Schaefer Center, which just opened last night, as a matter of fact, uh, and is a beautiful facility. It's been fully renovated, and uh, we're very proud of that uh, renovation. It makes a wonderful concert space and uh, space for other events. The room that you're in here is called the Gathering Hall. This is a new building, obviously, for the College of Education. Uh, we've been in here about two years, and um, we have had events in this room. We also have classes in these, in these rooms. We have these magical dividers that come down that uh, separate and allow us to have separate classes and separate meeting, and we have this kind of technology as well. So we are delighted to be in here. The students are delighted, the faculty are delighted, the staff is delighted, and boy, that is. <laughs> All right. Uh, <coughs> Again, I mentioned the, the uh, exhibit upstairs, and we're very proud of that. The, uh, the story of that is very simply that uh, it's one of those serendipitous things that happens every now and then, where somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who knew Eric Carr. And uh, through that chain of communication, uh, we came to have a dialogue with uh, Eric, and uh, he gave his permission for us to reproduce those illustrations, and uh, so we're very, very proud of that. And as far as we know, uh, this is the only display of his work in a public university on a permanent basis, and so we're very proud of that as well, okay? The uh, program today will be uh, structured in the following way. Uh, Eric will, will spend some time talking uh, about his work, and then he and I will have a bit of an interchange of questions and answers, and then we will save some time for questions uh, from the audience. There is one uh, kind of request that we make, and that is that you, when you raise your hand or stand up to ask a question, that it be just one question with not multiple parts, okay? Just one, no multiple parts, or no follow-up questions, okay? That's just to be fair to everybody in the, uh, in the audience. There will be a book signing after the program, uh, again, a couple of conditions there. Um, Eric has requested that uh, he not be asked to do personalized messages on the books because that again takes considerable time uh, and we limit you to no more than three items. All right, and again, this is an attempt to be as fair as possible to everyone. All right, I think, uh, I think those are uh, all the announcements that I have. Denise, did I leave anything out? You're fine. Okay, good. I have one problem today that I'll just share with you, it's a personal problem. 
and that is that uh, I have I am the victim of what is called creative refraction. No reaction. Okay. I bet it's happened to you. Essentially, I had to have my glasses changed, and the uh, optician got a bit creative apparently with the uh, prescription. And so I am having, quite honestly, a little difficulty reading text. So uh, bear with me. If I stumble a little bit, it's, I'm going to trace it back to my creative refraction. <laughs> um, and that takes me off the hook. Okay? But a little bit about Eric Carle. Eric Carle is acclaimed and beloved as a creator of brilliantly illustrated and innovatively designed picture books for very young children. His best known work, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, has eaten its way into the hearts of literally millions of children all over the world, and has been translated into more than 50 languages and sold over 33 million copies. Since The Caterpillar was published in 1969, Eric Carle has illustrated more than 70 books, many bestsellers, most of which he also wrote, and more than 110 million copies of his books have been sold around the world. Eric Carle's art is distinctive and instantly recognizable. His artwork is created in collage technique using hand-painted papers, which he cuts and layers to form bright and cheerful images. The secret of the Carl's books, appeal, uh, books appeal, lies in his intuitive understanding of and respect for children, who sense in him instinctively someone who shares their most cherished thoughts and emotions. Eric says, and I quote, I believe the passage from home to school is the second biggest trauma of childhood. The first is, of course, being born. Indeed, in both cases, we leave a place of warmth and protection for one that is unknown. The unknown often brings fear with it. In my books, I try to communicate this fear to replace it with a positive message. And I believe that children are naturally creative and eager to learn. I want to show them that learning is really both fascinating and fun. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Carl. autistic children. In my class is a boy of eight who does not, does not speak at all except to say Eric Carl. Oh. I, I often wonder what, what's going on, but I'm very pleased. Now many of you are educators or educators to be, and I'm pleased by that and I appreciate uh, your trust in me. And, um, Thank you, professor, for being here. 
my formal education has been more or less a disaster. <laughs> I dropped out of high school when I was 16 years old to study graphic design. As far back as I can remember, and long before I knew the word artist or art, uh, I knew that I would do pictures for, ch for people. That I know. I was born in 1929 in Syracuse, New York, where I started my formal education with Miss Fricky, who one day called in my mother to tell her that her son enjoyed drawing and painting pictures and that she and my father should um, nurture that talent, and my parents had always done that. I remember a large sun-filled room, large sheets of paper, fat brushes, and colorful paints. Miss Fricky was a friendly and caring woman. Somehow, my report card had survived. <laughs> After a visit of my German grandmother, my mother became hopelessly homesick, and my parents decided to return to their homeland in Germany. I was six years old, and so we sailed to Germany. Quickly, the little American cowboy became a little German Tyrolean. <laughs> so for weeks, I asked my parents, when are we going home again? When I realized that we would not return, I decided to become a bridge builder. And when I grew up, I would take my beloved grandmother across the wide ocean to Syracuse. That's my beloved grandmother. She all, all of her life, and until I came back to the United States, she was this wonderful grandmother, baked cookies for me, told me stories. She was a very and she loved coffee. <laughs> and during the war, we couldn't get coffee. Only after bombing, we would get like, you know, a teaspoon. And she would use it several times. <laughs> uh, my latest book to be published this fall picks up, no, I'm sorry. This early, where did I go from here? Oh, <laughs> oh I read it fast. I miss my playmate and friend in Syracuse, who soon sent me this touching letter. This, this early and deeply friendship is reflected in Do You Want to Be My Friend? Which happens to be my favorite book. I'm very often asked which is my favorite book of mine. This, this is it. Um, I visited Carl Meyer. Uh, we were, he was six, I was six, I left Germany, and I visited him 20 years later, and I, and I knocked at his door unannounced, and I said, who am I? He said, why, you're Eric. <laughs> My latest book uh, to be published this fall picks up the same theme, and it's simply called Friends. It's based on a photograph and I am obviously the little girl there. <laughs> we were three years old, and I often wonder whatever happened to her. My speech today will wander between Germany and the US, but, but stay with me. Within a week at my new school in Germany, my new teacher, a small and angry man, introduced me to the traditional thin and painful bamboo switch, three on each hand. For the next 10 years, I hated and feared school. Sometimes I think that the two extreme approaches, two first grades, two languages, two cultures, two educational philosophies, did indeed make somewhat of an educational expert out of me. <laughs> uh, perhaps in my books, I attempt to sort out these early uh, impressions. I miss the funny papers that my father read to me on Sunday mornings in Syracuse. I took my Mickey Mouse and Flash Gordon books with me to Germany. I especially like the beautiful women that Flash Gordon <laughs> forever, forever rescued. I couldn't get it out of them. 
MC에서. <웃음> In Germany, I began to read and love the classic Max and Moritz. Two loud spoon rascals terrorized everyone in the small town. Teacher, uncle, widow, tailor, everyone. It was published more than a hundred years ago, but it is still a bestseller. Max and Moritz, after many bad deeds, were caught hiding in the barn behind the sacks of weed, which, for no good reason, they had cut open. Here, the farmer uh, delivers them to the mill, for they are ground up and fed to the ducks. <laughs> Another German perennial children's bookseller is the Struble Peter. Uh, this was written by a doctor for a Christmas gift for his, his children. And um, he, uh, here are two examples. The girl is told not to play matches, but she does anyway. And when her mother got home, that's what she found of her daughter. <laughs> a boy sucks his thumb. His and this is what happened to him. <laughs> this book was first published in 1844 and is still a bestseller. <laughs> Selling over 100 million copies and incidentally Mark Twain translated it into English. <laughs> we, we tend to worry about the psycholog psychological damage that these sort of books may cause our children, but I suspect that they are to them what horror movies are to us adults. Deep down we know the chainsaw of murder is not real, but we do enjoy the spying, thrilling experience. In the US and later in Germany, my father and I explored our surroundings. We rescued a swallow that had damaged its wing. We taught he taught me how to catch a lizard and gently release it again. In 1939, when I was 10 years old, my parents and I spent our first and last vacation in the Black Forest. Shortly afterwards, World War broke out <clears throat> and my father was drafted into the Wehrmacht. I was uh, 18, year, 18 years old when he returned from a um, prisoner of war camp in Russia weighing about 85, 90, or 90 pounds. I was in art school interested in art and girls, and we never re-established re our old bond. Years later, I served in the US Army. So it goes to quote Kurt Vonnegut. By the way, the handsome one is my father. <laughs> and I have a goofy one, clearly. <laughs> As an 11-year-old boy, I spent my summer vacations at a small farm, and, uh, which made a deep impression on me. In the stable were three, these were very poor farmers, like the Middle Ages. These people had three cows and a few pigs, and I learned to milk the cow. Uh, chicken scratched on a dung heap, and in the garden I observed the bees. I have been raised a non-practicing Protestant, and, and this 100% Catholic village in Bavaria, I experienced a rich and deeply held faith. And Sunday mornings, I joined my host at their church services. I loved the ancient thick wall church, the Latin prayers, and the songs rising through the vaulted ceilings, the priest in his ornate robe, the intoxicated smell of incense, and the beautiful carved saints watching, saints watching over all. The tiny village seemed to be stuck in the Middle Ages. In my later life, Bruegel's The Harvester, painted in 1565, would become one of my favorite paintings. It reminded me of being a helper on the farm. At the end of the summer, I returned to Stuttgart, where my mother and I spent many nights in our cellar as bombs destroyed our city. Halfway through the war, we school children and our teachers were evacuated from, a, from the bombs to a small town near the Swiss border and assigned to local families. I had the great luck to be assigned to a family whose name is Gute Kunst, which means good art. <laughs> they were very good to me and I'm still in touch with their family. 
We can so we children continue our already um, fragile education. The Nazi uh, reg regime rejected modern, abstract, and expressionistic art, calling it degenerate art. The artists were forbidden to paint it, and some of these paintings were even destroyed. One day, I was perhaps 12 or 13, Herr Krauss, my high school art teacher, <clears throat> invited me to the privacy of his home and showed me reproductions of the so-called de uh, degenerate artists. The Franz Mark, I uh, remember something else before. And uh, Kirchner, the expressionist. He told me I'm instructed to teach my pupils realistic and naturalistic art, but I like your loose style. Look at the looseness of the work of these artists, he said. Then he got agitated and said, these Nazi charlatans, he fumed, they have no idea what art is. I had never seen such work before, and I was shocked by the strange art, and I was shocked by Herr Krauss's open contempt for the Nazis. But somehow this moment never, never left me. After the war was over, I asked Herr Krauss, what profession are, you, are open to me, a uh, boy who hates and fears school? And he re recommended that I study with Professor Schneidler at the Academy of Applied Arts. Applied Arts really means the things we use them today, you know, it's, it's not high art. Uh, applied arts is advertising, it's lettering, uh, it's designing things. I had just turned 16 and left high school to become a devoted student of my new master. Finally, here I began to breathe again. Whether it is type design, <coughs> posters, uh, these are not mine, <laughs> wallpaper, portrait stamps, houseware, textiles, calligraphy, book jackets, that happens to be mine. But just to na name a few, somebody has to design these, and Schneidler insisted that this was done with great care and a sense of responsibility and integrity. All visual pollution had to be avoided. There is so much visual pollution in our life today. Uh, I'm the type of, I'm a graphic designer still. When we go to a restaurant, the first thing I do, I redesign the menu. <laughs> as, we, as we drive down the highway, I redesign the posters. I mean, the, just, here are these enormous highway posters, and you go at 70 miles an hour, and it's a pale background with little gray lettering on it. You have, you have, you know, I forget exactly, I would say you have maybe 20 seconds, 10 seconds. You're supposed to read all that? <laughs> and that's a sign from the aesthetics. So that's one of my beefs. Uh, at the high, I, I also learned colorful collages. These are really not finished pictures, uh, sketches only. This led to my first job as a poster designer for the America House. The America House was part of the U.S. Information Center. Uh, during the war, the Nazi propaganda described uh, the United States, a land of gangsters, chewing gum, and skyscrapers. <laughs> this is Al Capone up here. The America House, Part of the U.S. information was in all, all large uh, German cities, which countered the impression of the Nazi propaganda. There, there was a library with American magazines and books. Plays were performed. Movies were shown and discussed. Seminars conducted. Music performed. And ideas exchanged. For these events, it was my job to design posters. Here are just a few with uh, the, 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 glass, the glass menagerie where it, uh, and over the America House was introducing American culture in our writers and so forth. Uh, public relations, which was 
until then of hardly known concept, public relations. Uh, in fact, this, this lecture was conducted by Klaus Küster. He was a, a German prisoner of war in the United States and learned about public relations and, and brought an in a lecture um, uh, West Africa. Uh, this actually was my first. This was in conjunction with the America House in German and German uh, Museum. Two years later, in 1952, almost 23, oh, that, uh, that music post here. Uh, can we go back? Okay. Yeah. Uh, like, like, <clears throat> like abstract art, Hitler, the uh, general degenerate art also included music. Uh, some of these musicians were forbidden or Jewish uh, composers. So this is also shown to the German people. Uh, two years later, in 1952, I was almost 23. I, I arrived in New York, New York City with $40 in my pocket. Uh, I had some brought over some my samples of my work, which helped me to get my very first job in the New York Times as a graphic designer. Then later I worked for an advertising agency that specialized in pharmaceutical advertising. Uh, one of my ads showed in, showed in uh, a lobster, and it was an antihistamine, <laughs> antihistamine uh, product. Bill Martin saw this and asked me to illustrate his brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Soon I asked myself, what if I were an author as well? And I worked on ideas and stored them in a cardboard box. Eventually I quit my job in order to freelance. A small publisher commissioned me to illustrate in black and white, which is <laughs> An American historical cookbook. It was lots of fun. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, the editor, Anne Benedouis, was also the children's book editor. And uh, I told her about my idea of the box, the cardboard box, which led to my own first book, One, Two, Three to the Zoo. Since I was not sure of commas and periods and things like that and grammar, I made it a worthless book. <laughs> <laughs> but Anne reassured me. She said, I'm not interested in commas and periods and grammar. I'm interested in ideas. How encouraging. And I've worked with Anne ever since, all these years. Even if I work with different publishers, She's always my editor. Someone said, are you in love with her? And I said, yes. <laughs> Throw books, we are in love with each other. I'm very lucky, very, very lucky. To illustrate my books in color, I used the collage technique, which I had learned, as I mentioned before, when I studied graphic uh, design. I create my own uh, painted papers and store them. Oh, go on. These are a few samples. I have hundreds of these, and I store them in a color, color coded drawers, and they are my palette. Collage, of course, is nothing new. Fine artists like Picasso and Matisse uh, are doing collages but also picture book artists like uh, Leo Leone and Ezra Jack Keats, um, Snowy Day here, do their artwork also in collages. I'm very interested in textures, both in nature. Uh, can we go back to nature? It is, it's amazing. Um, uh, I, for instance, photograph parking lots, the, the lines and things, with what's going on. Uh, in nature, years ago, uh, I had a Japanese publisher um, had me interviewed for three days with a group of reporters or whatever. And I made, when you can do that too with your children, you cut out a little, you take a 
you know, these days when you cut out a square, and then you look at things, pebbles, and the sky, and grass, and uh, concrete, and it's amazing when you separate it from, when you separate it, something from its environment. Uh, and the children love it so much. Uh, I took them to a museum. I took them to a museum. I'm going to get to that later. <laughs> uh, I'm interested both in nature and in paintings. Now here, look, um, look just at the ocean, and when you enlarge that, you get this. And they look like my papers. Um, the next one is a Renoir. Between his face and her face, and you see her hat a little bit there, there are, I think, is, are these brush strokes. And a Van Gogh, uh, you look underneath the sun, and it's just separated, blown up, and it's an abstract painting. Uh, those kind of things really uh, turn me on. One day, I playfully punched holes in the stack of paper, and looking at the holes, a bookworm came to my mind. Now, uh, what did that lead to? <laughs> the bookworm became a green worm, but my good editor, Ed, wasn't so happy with the green worm. And she said, how about caterpillar? And I said, Butter and I said butterfly. I have been fortunate, and so my wife and I decided that it was time to give back. With the generous help of the very hungry caterpillar, friends, publishers, and a gift of seven acre building site from Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, we have built a 40,000 square foot museum. The Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art, which opened 10 years ago. In its three galleries, the work of picture book artists from all over the world is shown. The there's an auditorium, an art studio for adults and children, a reading library, and a bookshop. Uh, the museum is not a children's museum per se. It is a museum for all. So come and visit. And if you can afford it, become a member of the museum. It's an Amherst. I hope I have provided you with a rough outline of one person's path. <clears throat> a path at times planned, and at times like the proverbial cork in the sea blowing this way and that way. Let me end with another one, one more letter. Dear Eric, your books are good. My teacher, my teacher made us read all of your books. <laughs> Will you ever retire? <laughs> questions and then we'll open it up to the rest of the sure okay okay good I want to sit down <laughs> can you can you see him at all yeah. okay all right I think I think he deserves a little bit of, of a break yeah. okay. Okay. Um, you talked about your your uh, your teachers and so forth could you could you just elaborate a little bit on your first grade first grade teacher uh, I, have a, I do not remember what Miss Freaky looked like, but I still have a sense of her. And I also, I always talk about the, the, the fat brushes and the big, big sheets of paper and the colorful paints and then all that freedom and the light streaming in. And, and years and years ago, I, when I visited my friend Carlton, 
I, somebody took me to a, my old school there, which in the meantime has been restored to an apartment house. But going up the street for all these trees and houses, and but not when you get when you get to the, our school building, it's a little bit on a, a little higher and has no trees, and there's all this lighting. So as a five, six year old, somehow I was aware of the light and the screen and the light. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you had some other teachers also that you, you talked about, uh, Bergola and Kraus and Ernst Schneidler. Right. Uh, any particular memories that you have of those two? Uh, Kraus, um, my, my high school, uh, Kraus, uh, before the Hitler time had been along to the socialist uh, youth movement. And so, it really became an art teacher who was told to keep his mouth shut, and he was never pulled over it. So it's, it's surprising that uh, he would be taking this home and showing his work. And uh, Schneider was really old. Uh, I don't think he could be a professor anymore today. He was. He was Prussian from Berlin in World War I. He had been an officer. And uh, I, I, he's still in my, in my thinking and my creative life. In fact, I, uh, even today, I say, what would the, the time to say what I'm doing? Uh, he, He accepted me. I was only 16 years old. Uh, the requirements were that you had have had uh, a finished, you know, high school diploma, uh, that you had to have uh, either that or have a profession, uh, a finished apprenticeship of uh, of uh, any graphic profession, uh, printing, lithography, type that kind of thing. But he he just took me in. You know, there was no. He, had, he made his own law class. And uh, then this actually went to my head because I was the youngest Wunderkind, you know, trying to array. So after a year, he called me in. He says, You're the least talented student I've had in 40 years. <laughs> You're fired. Oh. I went home to my mother, my father's away. And she says, oh, that old man, you just go back and tell him if you could spend a year with him, you're not going to waste that year. So I went back and I knocked his door, stuck my head in, and he says, you can stay without a work for me. But you will all, you're not going to be an artist for the next year. You're going to be an apprentice in the pipe that is typesetting. The typesetting back then was your little uh, lead type, and you know, a little eight point, ten point, some of you may know. It was like Gutenberg's type, and, it, and it, it, re it required a discipline, which, that's why he put me in the type shop. And it required a discipline which has served me until now. I hope it has served me. So that's just a little bit about it. Uh, you're well, awesome. I, look, this is the beauty of it. It was, sending me to the type shop was not a punishment. It was a caring, caring gesture, right? He knew that's what I mean, what you're doing. Yeah. So that tells you a lot about trying to in a few sentences. Uh, good. What about, uh, you also mentioned Leo Leone. Leo Leone. When I uh, arrived in the United States, I had my, I, I only had one two days, and I couldn't bring much of what I brought. Some of my work along which I felt were nice and presentable. And, but I didn't know much about New York and the design field. But someone said, go to the, the art director show and I'll give you on, give you an idea of what is going on in New York in, in terms of advertising. And the, and the designs that stuck in my mind were Leo Leone, who at that time was the art director of Fortune. 
So I was just naive, breathing hard. I went down, I went to the phone booth, looked up the porch and went to see him and called up Leo Leone. And I got him on the phone. <laughs> and uh, so I said, I, I admire your work, baby. And uh, maybe you like mine. And I'm looking for a job. And he said, well, come on up the phone morning at 11 o'clock. So I'm in there. And he was in the top one of the top floors of Rockefeller Center. He had a staff of people, and, and African art of the wall and Persian rocks. And, and it was a sheer coincidence that he picked up the phone. I would have never had anybody else ever. No, I don't want to make a long story, but he called up uh, his friend over at the New York Times, uh, the promotion department. And Leona said, well, Leona said he, he could possibly hire me for his private studio. But he said, the trouble is you'll be by, uh, all by yourself. You need to learn English and so forth. So uh, he called up his friend, Alfred, at the New York Times. And uh, Leona said, how much would you like to earn? And I said, <laughs> my father lived in the United States. He was making forty dollars a week during the depression, and he always said that's a lot of money. So I said forty dollars a week. <laughs> he said, No, I would give you at least a hundred dollars. I said, No, no, you can't do it. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> so anyway, the New York Times people called me up and I, this this way only. I called him up. He says, Before you go, come in. So I went in, and he said, Okay, they want to hire you. You say, and they ask you how much you want to earn. You say, $100 a week. And he says, I'll never talk to you again if you don't. <laughs> so anyway, they hired me, and they said, how much would you like to earn? I whispered, $100 a week. And my future boss said, 85 Yes, yes! <laughs> children's books, as you may know, for his grandchildren, and he thought, I, I had always tried to show this book at that time, he thought I should do a children's book too. He set up an appointment with his editor for me, and he said, nice work, don't call us, we call you. And <laughs> Leo was set up, next year set up an appointment again, and it didn't work. So anyway, that's, and then Leo and he, we, we're never close friends, little Katie's made a lot of sure that made him a polo and they were dinners, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And he's, he, as a, as a person and his work, is a hero to me. Mm -hmm. Some people are, are curious, I, I imagine, about uh, how many of your books are about yeah. what some people would call bugs. Uh, yes. could, you, could you comment on that? Yeah. Well, that has to do with my father. My father took me for walks in nature, both in the United States and in Germany. And uh, we would live in rocks and feel bark and look for little bugs and things. And he would explain the lifestyle of a bee or an ant or something. Uh, so we, we uh, with all the small animals, because in Germany they don't have elephants, so <laughs> what about working on somebody else's book, providing the illustrations, versus yeah. you're writing your own book and providing the illustrations? Yeah. Uh, with Bill Martin, we meshed well. Uh, Bill Martin. Bill Martin was an interesting man. He couldn't read until he was 20 or something. I mean, he faked that he knew a little bit. And then one teacher says, Bill, you cannot read. And Bill says, you're right, I cannot read. And uh, that man taught him, a teacher, taught him writing, uh, uh, um, reading through rhythm. And the, Brown bear, and brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see the red bird. It's the heartbeat. That's how he learned to read. And four years later, he did a doctorate in education. 
and uh, he was a god sent to me. I mean, I, I only met wonderful people. Even my wife. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit more about the kind of process that that results in, for example, the gorilla that's sitting yeah. in my conference room. Okay. Yeah. Well, at Ridge Niagara we did uh, collages, and we painted our own papers. Then we had a method. We had just regular, let's say, a station size papers, right? and uh, you take uh, a pot of green paint here and a pot of red paint here, and then. You, you paint the first sheet in green, the second sheet you put a drop of red in, and so forth, and so forth. So theoretically you wind up only theoretically you wind up with few red. Right. We did this with all kinds of colors. And with that we made our collages. So I always I never used them afterwards until in at when I was in advertising, I was an art director. As an art director, you have a product. And every year you need a different style. So one style I did black and white illustrations. Not necessarily mine, I would hire an illustrator. Next year you did photography. Next year you did big big type. Next year you did little tiger. And then you did I remember the the classes I did with uh, Schneider. And I found that these uh, Color tissue paper with my the hues. Uh, but quickly I found out that from there was done that way. But I found out that they uh, fade quickly. So now I buy white tissue papers and the acrylic paints. I paint all kinds of structures and colors and mix and splash and paint of you know, walk over and just to get all kinds of textures. But I make these papers when I prepare them, I don't have any books in mind. Just, I, I start out with blues and until the blues they get muddy, then I start with yellows until they get muddy. So. And then you, so then when you do get to a story, you begin to draw those together. Yes. How, how, how do you decide on that color time? Well, let's say the category. I have a lot of green. Yeah. So go to that drawer you saw with the green. And I take out the whole bunch. Uh, it's got, he's got a red head, so I go to my red drawer. Mm -hmm. out of and as you look at the body of the uh, caterpillars, all different kinds of green. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I do something which I, you shouldn't get most of your ideas with that. Which I use razor blades, so don't let your children. Tell me you sit. Those blood sits with them. So, so what do you see as uh, kind of the elements of a successful book? There, there really is such a thing, beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> Sounds corny, but it's true. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, let's open uh, open the questions from the floor. Um, if you'd raise your hand and, and speak up. Yes? You're such a wonderful storyteller. Here in the mountains of North Carolina, we all tell stories, and we think it came from Germany. Did you 
Yes, she did. Uh, for instance, Walter the Baker. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a, a story she told me. Okay. Walter the Baker, he delivered the, these rolls to the local duke or whatever. And then one day he cheated it. He was more instead of milk. And then the duke says he was mm -hmm. abolishing for the kingdom. Unless he can invent a bread for which is something like shine three times. And that's the story of my grandmother. I had a large family. Mom, my grandmother was one of, she had nine, she had eight sisters and one brother. There were ten children. And they all lived around. And they were all storytellers. They talked about their childhood. My father was a wonderful story. He was a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, you know, he, he had lived in the United States and when my parents returned, my father's name was also Eric the Pagans. Eric tell us a story from America. And his stories got more and more embellished over time. <laughs> <laughs> but everything really wanted to return. Other questions. What is your favorite color? What is my favorite color? <laughs> There are two parts. All colors are beautiful. But I get this question a lot, too. So I haven't made up my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I notice children always put a yellow sun in the upper corner, and the left corner, the right corner. So officially, yellow is my favorite color. <laughs> but it was a little pressure by the children. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. How do you know when an illustration is finished? Uh, you know, yeah. but sometimes I don't know. I, for instance, uh, uh, the, the, plot, the slow book. I did the whole book and it wasn't right, so I redid it. The whole book. When do you know? It, it's intuition. It's intuition. Well, obviously, your intuition is very good. <laughs> In the back, question? Oh, okay. What advice do you have for an inspired author or illustrator? Advice for an aspiring author or illustrator? The magic words are do it. <laughs> But I know the power of how you find a publisher and things like that. I ask a lot. I cannot help you much. Um, as you heard, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't try to to write an illustrated books. I slithered into it <laughs> by by Phil Martin seeing my illustration. And my aunt Benedu is giving me a, a job to illustrate a book. So I, I, I know so many people try so hard. And <clears throat> nowadays it's even harder to get in. You need an agent and things like that. Uh, I, I, saw, I looked for the agent. She said, when you think it's come back to me. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that's powerful. Any other? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. You? <laughs> What's your favorite book? My favorite book? Yes. Of mine? Any. Any. <laughs> <laughs> Gives you a little latitude. Um, <laughs> um, that there's so many, I don't know. You just like to read? I know. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> yes? Have you ever considered putting together a book of simple art techniques for teachers, like the uh -huh. little one you just did with yes. a piece of white paper to help a child isolate something. Yes. Um, my children love to try to reproduce your books. So uh -huh. have, have you ever thought of doing something like that? Well, we, we, years ago, we did um, with, 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 with class. You know the class books? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the guy? How to make a collage. How to make a collage, very kind. And it had reproductions of my papers and instructions, but it never did well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the end of the story. How to do every car work? There's, there's a moral there. <laughs> teachers, teachers don't have any money. Okay. <laughs> One more question. Yes. Have you ever received a rejection letter from a publisher or an author? And if so, how many? Or <laughs> In my speech, I stress that I've been a lucky person. And Benedict, uh, my, my editor, has never rejected at all. And, but that doesn't mean every idea was good. We just gradually talk less and less about an idea. <laughs> And we both know where to drop it. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so many, you know, of, of authors and stuff, they, uh, they proudly wallpaper their bathroom with rejection slips. I didn't have that opportunity. I was very really fortunate. But not every idea I had was, is, uh, over. Well, we thank you. We thank you very much, Eric, for taking this. Thank you. We will. We will be moving out into the rotunda. Uh, we'll be out there in about, give us about 10 minutes so that Eric has a little break time and we'll uh, have the book signing out there and there's also refreshments out there.